All right, in this video, we're going to pick up where we left off last time with our model of uh, current flow, where we're treating the electrons or other charge carriers as if they're um, free particles moving along with a random motion, but then a battery is applied in electric field and caused them to start drifting. So they're going all sorts of ways, and if there was no battery, they'd be doing this, and on average, they wouldn't be moving at all. But with the battery, they're still bouncing all over the place, but very slowly they're beginning to, if they're positive particles, to move in the direction of the electric field, so that's the direction of the force, cause them to accelerate. But if they're electrons, in fact, they'd be going the other direction. But even though they're going the opposite direction, the current is in the direction a positive charge would flow. Now, to get a quantitative measurement of that, we're going to look at some material properties. First, the microscopic view, we're going to define N, where N is the number of charge carriers per volume. There are so many electrons because there are so many atoms inside of these materials, and so many of the electrons are conduction electrons, which are relatively free and allowed to be these ones moving around. This is related, obviously, to the number of atoms, and hence to the uh, density. And different materials have different numbers of these. Some may have absolutely no electrons, or very few that are free to move around. VD is the drift velocity of the charge carrier. Q is the charge on the carrier. If it's an electron, that's E. But these could also be gas ions in, in a liquid, or it could, or in a plasma gas. So there could be something like 2E or something. And then we have the cross-sectional area. Now, to find the amount of charge moving, we need to find the number of carriers and multiply by the charge per carrier. This is kind of looking, looking at, if a person is going to put some money in the bank account, I need to know how much money each deposit is and the number of deposits. So the, the amount per deposit is here, and the number of deposits, in essence, is like the number of carriers. To find the number of carriers, we have in the number per volume, and then we need to multiply by the volume. Well, the volume is the cross-sectional area times the thickness, which would be dx. So you can think of this, for instance, if we think of a cylinder, then the volume here, this is dx, and this area is a, and then dv, the volume, is a dx. So I multiplied the volume times the carriers per volume to get the number of carriers. Then I multiply that by the charge per carrier. The charge per carrier is Q. But dx is simply the drift velocity times delta t. Well, dt, I should say. So if I put that in, I now have N A B D D T times Q. But that means if I divide both sides by dt, I have dt, dq dt is equal to n times a times q times the drift velocity. So let me read that. That's the charge, number of carriers per volume, times the cross-sectional area, times the charge on a carrier, times the drift velocity. But the derivative of charge with respect to time is the current. So I've now got a relation between the current and two well-defined characteristics, this drift velocity and this charge per carrier. Now, if you're building microscopic devices at Texas Instruments or whatever, then you may have it where the electrons are not as free to move in one direction as another. So, in fact, we usually want to talk about not just the, the current, but the current per unit area. That is, for the size of this wire. I want to take out the properties that are dependent on geometry so that the stuff I have left are actual material properties that are the same for each material. In other words, copper, no matter what size the copper, it has the same properties. This does not, because if I make the area of the copper wire bigger, I change the current that would carry. So I can't post that. That's what is called an extensive property. It depends on how much. 
I need to get rid of that and get to what's called an intensive property. I need to get rid of this, this area out of here. So I want to divide the area on both sides so that I get a number that's independent on the size of the wire. When you do that, you get a quantity called the current density. And it's given a new symbol, J, which is very close to I in the alphabet. And it's called the current divided by the area and consequently from the formula we just had before, the current density depends on how many charge carriers are in a volume, the charge on those carriers, and this thing, the drift velocity. So if you want something to have a better ability to carry current for a given area of wire, you want to find a material that has a bigger drift velocity. If the particles can move faster, then they can carry more charge. On the other hand, if they don't move faster, but they carry each one of them has more charge, they have a bigger Q, then you would also improve the current density. Or if you simply had more of the charge carriers, even if they're moving at the same speed with the same amount of charge, the material with the bigger chart um, number of carriers per volume will have the largest current density capacity. And so that's what people do. They play around looking for these unique materials and they tabulate this in book. And this determines whether or not you want to use one material or another material. Now at the microscopic level, these guys can be in different and different values. These are really vectors. So this drift velocity, of course, is a vector. And this current density is a vector. So if we're not just talking about going along a wire, but we're building some sort of like three-dimensional structure in a semiconductor, like maybe something like this, then you can talk about having current densities one way, having one value, but if they were going this away, they might have a different value, all right, because it's easier for the charges to move this way and maybe hard for it to move that direction. So consequently, these are actually vectors in such problems. For most metals and things like that, there is no difference in the direction that they move. And so these kind of finer points are usually left for upper level courses. Let's give an example of doing a problem like this. It says, what is the magnitude of the drift velocity of an electron in lumen if 5 amps of current flow through an aluminum wire of area 4 by 10 to minus 6 meters squared, assuming each electron, each aluminum atom, provides one electron for current conduction. So here are the things I was told. I got the density out of a table in the textbook, but you can also get it out of the CRC or any other reference book. But you need that because you need this to find the number of atoms in a, in a particular volume. And if I know the number of atoms, I know there's one electron per atom, so therefore I can find N. So N is going to be found by taking the density Dividing by the gram molecular weight, that will give me the number of moles, and then multiplying by Avogadro's number. So this is 2.7 grams per centimeter cubed. The gram molecular weight is 27 grams per mole for lumen. And then we multiply that by 6.02 by 10 to the 23rd per mole. The moles cancel, the grams cancel, and we get, this is divide by 10, this makes it 6.02 by 10 to the 22nd centimeters to the minus three. All right, now we go and we find the um, drift velocity, Vd, is equal to the current divided by the area times N times Q. The current was five amps. On the bottom here, we have an area of 4 by 10 to the minus 6 meters squared.
we have 6.02 by 10 to the 22nd centimeters to the minus 3. We have 1.6 by 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. And then we've got to get rid of these centimeters to the minus 3. So we need to multiply by 100 centimeters per 1 meter. And we need to cube that. So we punch all that into a calculator and see what we come up with. So 4 second e to the minus 6 times 6.02 second e to the 22nd times 1.6 second e to the minus 19 times 100 raised to the third. Invert that, multiply by 5 and we get a drift velocity of 130 microns per second. Now I said earlier that the random motion of these things can be in kilometers per second, but the drift velocity is only in microns per second. So Inside your electrical wire, when you flip a switch, an electron doesn't move all the way from the switch to the light to turn it on. It's the disturbance of the electric field we'll find that propagates because there are electrons all through the wire. One of them bumps into the, another one who bumps into another one. It's like a chain reaction who knocks the electron who's already at the light into the light. The actual electron moving from the light switch to the light will take a long time to get there. All right, we'll see you again in another video.